I think we should talk about social media real quick before we turn the microphones on. Last week we had um, Cal Newport on the show and he sort of talked us out of social media and we're going to give it up for the rest of this year just as an experiment because I want to sort of put my money where my mouth is or really align my values with my actions is mm. probably a better way to put mm. that. And I always talk about having a willingness to walk away from anything to see whether or not it adds value. I'm not about renouncing social media. If I get value from it, great. But the question is, do we get value from it? And so what we're going to do for the rest of this year is we're getting rid of social media. And we have about 4 million followers across all platforms. And it could be a terrible business decision or it might not make a difference at all. Or in some world, it might help improve what we create because we're not chasing the mm. algorithm or as TK says, we're not hypnotized by the algorithm. The algorithm can hypnotize you in a way that you start chasing it, not even knowing you've been chasing it because you've been hypnotized by it. And as soon as I mentioned that to you before we turn these microphones on, I saw your eyes light up, Griffin, and you were like, huh, maybe that's a, a direction that I want to go. I don't know if this is actually bringing more people mm -hmm. to my to my shows. I've, I've thought about it many times. And when I have conversations with people about social media, I always say there was no way I would be on social media if I didn't have to announce my new music or my shows to people. It's like the only, I would, I would give that gift to myself of like walking away. I just feel like it would, I feel like it's irresponsible of me to like jump off all the platforms. Cause I think, well, what if, what if these, this is the only way that people find out about my shows, but I really don't know if people find my shows and my new music that way or not, or if that would just be absolutely fine if I never made a post again and people would show up at the same venue. I, I don't know, but it would be, I'm curious to know. And if I found out that it had very little impact after all, I would be really glad to not to spend less time on my phone and social media for sure. What would the benefits of that be for you being able to walk away from it? More time, more time and space, more time for creativity, less, I mean, I know that it's, I, I find myself in moments where like, I'm just looking at this thing out of a complete and utter mm -hmm. impulse. It's like, an, I, I notice when that happens and then I have to like correct myself, put it down, go on to what I'm doing. But even sometimes when I'm reading a book, I can be really into a book, I'll be three pages down, and the phone's like just right here, like, pick me up. Yes. Check, check me. See what's going on over here. There's something more interesting over here. And I'll do it without thinking about it. And I'm like, what am I doing? Or even times when I'm trying to just enjoy a movie and the, the thing is like putting out energy toward me to just pick it up. My, my wife and I talk about that. And, you know, she's, she has a much less addictive personality than I do by far. Mm -hmm. And I look at her sometimes and I'm like, you're way more addicted to that thing than I am. Like, and that's what's funny about it. Is, and that must mean that it's a very, uh, it's a very addictive thing. So I think thinking about all that, it, it wouldn't surprise me if you guys were on the forefront of leading that, that charge away from that. I think that it has to shift in some way soon to because people know we we all kind of know what's going on but it's just kind of hard to get out of the vortex and the the hypnotizing effects of all of it you know and now we're here in the middle of it and it's like everything is running through that yeah and the world you know the common knowledge is like oh you have to do that for your business you're like maybe you don't yeah and and i think cal newport who was on last week he is the premier example of he's someone who has sold millions of books and his books are translated in like 40 different languages and yet he has never once been on social media however i think the flip side of that is there are a lot of people who have built entire careers i mean you could argue justin bieber i don't wouldn't call youtube social media necessarily but it has social media components to mm -hmm. it for sure you could say Justin Bieber wouldn't have had a career potentially. Maybe he would have still. We don't know the alternate reality. But there are certainly people who have made a career. And so I don't want to demonize it, but yeah. I also want to recognize, as you suggested here, there's a tug that maybe we don't even realize it's having on us. And maybe we are at the forefront of something. TK came to me maybe a, a month or two ago and was like, I think the age of the influencer is coming to an end. Can you expand on that a bit? <laughs> I love hearing the Snickers in the background. <laughs> um, I think the economic incentives that are driving 
conversations and content today are past their time and people know it, people feel it, but they don't really know how to get out of the matrix right now. Do you have an example of that? Sure. So um, kudos to all of the early leading edge influencers who showed us that there is a middle ground between being a Hollywood superstar who makes $20 million a film and being someone who just can't get paid at all to act or do comedy or sing. There's this wide middle ground, like we talked about before, where, hey man, you can make a few thousand dollars, some people $20,000 and higher a month on YouTube through the ad revenue. And so there's this great influx of people coming in, creating content and doing their thing. But because of the way the ad revenue model works, you've got to create a ton of content and get a ton of engagement. And once you've been around for a couple of years and you've done your thing, it's like, all right, what am I going to do in an environment where the rules for what gets shown on people's news feed keeps changing, where the rules for what gets promoted on the front page of YouTube keeps changing? What can I do now to get attention? And, and a lot of people are doing this sort of tap dance routine of keeping up with what's hot okay, I've got to find a way to connect what's hot with my brand so that I can stay relevant. And people are exhausted, I think, about this battle, from this battle of trying to stay relevant. And I think people are looking for a different way. You, you, you see it with Patreon and a lot of other people exploring other platforms and so on, but no one's really figured out how to do it. But I truly believe this is one of those things where people will fight for the right to cling to it because of perceived necessity. But if you show people there's a better way, they would gladly let it go and do it. At this point, there are so many people who would love to be shown a way to opt out of that game. And I just think there's a there's a mass uh, amount of burnout when it comes to this mm -hmm. stuff. What do you think? I agree. I agree. I, I think that's really well said. And I, I'm feeling like just social media in general feels like it's got to Something's got to shift at some point. I don't know if it can go on like that forever, which I, I, I start to want, I'm kind of glad to hear both of you say that because sometimes my, my music started before any of this stuff was available. Like you didn't have to have followers anywhere. I mean, when I started, there was maybe MySpace and you put like four songs up there and you were definitely my uh, top eight on MySpace. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's what I knew. And then, and then I kind of missed the whole. I missed the game with all that stuff because I was, I had already been doing it one way and I was just used to writing songs and touring and doing my art. And then I kind of like looked up at some point and went, oh, there's all these tricks to social media that you're supposed to use to self-promote. And I, I also realized I'm not any good at this and I'm not even sure if I want to be. And both of those things together kind of made me sort of made me feel inferior in the social media realm for sure. It's like, I don't even know how to do this if I wanted to, but I don't really like spending time in this place either. And then people are telling me I need to like do more on here and I feel pressured to spend all this time and energy on it. And then when I did, it didn't really work. And so I'd kind of be relieved if I didn't have to think about it anymore. Yeah. It'd be nice for me, but I don't know. I'm, I think it makes sense that it would that would need to change. It's got to be burnout with just yeah. that game. And yet it's a little bit scary for a few reasons. One is there are monetary, potential monetary implications of that for mm. people who earn a living online. Yeah. I'm less worried about that. The other implication is like, you feel like you're losing a piece of yourself. There's right. this false identity, right? We are the number of views that we have or the number of followers we have. And those things can be useful and instructive in a mechanical sense. If you're trying to demonstrate something to a record label or a, a tour promoter or whatever, that's one thing. You demonstrate it through metrics because it's a shortcut for your relevance, quote unquote, uh, to a general populace. However, I, I think that by letting go of that, you also, the fear is like, who am I without that identity? Mm. At the Palm Springs event, TK, on the Everything Tour, we were just talking about, there was this book, Thin Skin, that you were reading from, and it was about identity and how our identity is this thin skin, but we create that skin. And it's terrifying because if I get rid of a piece of my identity, this is what we talk about all the time with the minimalists and our material possessions become a piece of our identity. 
nothing wrong with stuff. I'm all for stuff. I enjoy my things. In fact, as a minimalist, I could make the argument that I enjoy my things much more than my pre-minimalist days. I didn't really enjoy my things that much. I just accumulated, I amassed those things. And I think there's an arg- argument to be made for social media as well. Maybe we're mm-hmm. doing that with social media. We're just amassing followers or accumulating content, producing things. Professor Sean, before we started recording, he was talking about one of the problems with with late stage capitalism is this desire to constantly produce, produce, produce. One must produce or one does not exist. Hmm. And that, to me, that isn't the initial spirit of what one might call capitalism, voluntaryism, perhaps, or just living a voluntary life, because it is coercive in really pernicious ways. Hmm. It's coercive in the sense that we don't even realize we're being coerced by the platform or maybe even by the algorithm, or maybe you're being coerced by the comments now. And that therefore, imagine if every song you wrote, Griffin, you sourced the comments first mm-hmm. to then gauge mm. the kind of song you should make tomorrow. I know. I just thought of something while you were talking about that. And then my friend who's in a, a totally separate world, a uh, totally separate business, he he spent like a really minimal amount of money. Like I think it was like 50 bucks or something and and bought like a thousand followers. I'm making these these numbers up, but it was like a lot of followers for a really small amount of money. And I know that I've had so many people say, oh, you can't even get a book deal unless you have X amount of followers and or a record deal. And it's all like optics. So people will actually spend money getting fake followers so that the page looks better. Yeah. And then so if that's going on all the time, anyway, like when, when do they start to see through that and go, oh, it really doesn't matter because this, it says this person has 100,000 followers, but the, how many of them are paid for? I'm like, I'm not going to play that game. Like, I can't do that. I'm right. not going to care about buying people so my page looks good. Like, there's no way I can, I can slide into that world. Well, it doesn't even, it's not about looking good aesthetically. It's about looking good to gatekeepers, right? right? Yeah. Alabama's been going through this as well. She does voiceover work. And mm-hmm. sometimes when she applies to something, it's like, you must have at least 50,000 Instagram followers. It makes yeah. me want to throw and up. You can go buy those. I mean, it's so silly. <laughs> But, well, but think about money to me. Think about the business incentives behind that. Like if we get Malabama to be a voiceover in our video game or on our commercial and she has 50,000 followers, mm-hmm. well, that's 50,000 new people that we are exposing to our product. They, in a weird way, are buying an audience by buying mm-hmm. famous voiceover mm-hmm. actors as opposed to the merit. I mean, Malabama's got a beautiful voice. Why not hire her for that as opposed to how many followers she may or may not have? That's always been a weird thing about being a guest on different podcasts or mm. or people pitching us to be. We don't uh, accept pitches, but um, they'll say, oh, we have this number of followers or whatever. Like That's going to compel me to bring you on the podcast. We've had people on this show with zero followers like Cal Newport, but we've had people who aren't famous at all in any way, but it's an interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. But I find that even even though I'm intentional about these things, you start to think about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm kind of on the fence about this, that we were thinking about having this guest, but they do have a lot of followers. Maybe that will give us more reach. Mm. But it's just growth for the sake of growth as opposed to, oh, yeah, I think that'd be a really fascinating conversation. That's why I want to have Griffin in here today. Like We we didn't have a, a guest slot. Today, today was a non-guest episode, but like Griffin's like, I'm going to be in town. I'm bummed I missed his show last night. It was up in Santa Barbara, but I, uh, I'm like, if Griffin's going to be in town, I want him to be able to come on the show so we can talk about some of these things. Mm. As you know, the show is a listener-driven show. I'd love to answer, have you help us answer a listener question about music and minimalism. This question is from Steven. Hi, my name is Steven. I'm from Highlands Ranch, Colorado. I have a question. I'm a musician. I'm a minimalist in all areas of my life, but I have a studio full of gear. Sometimes I consider selling some of the gear, but other times I fear selling it, regretting it, and thinking that maybe I'll be rebuying it later. How do I know if it's just in case versus just for when? So, Griffin, we have this, we call it the just in case rule versus the just for win rule. It's, we have this minimalist rule book. It's 16 rules for living with less. You can download it for free on our website, theminimalists.com slash rule book. And 
it's a free download, so you don't have to, to pay us anything for that. But the the thing to think about with just for win versus just in case items, a just in case item is like, oh, you know what? I'm going to hold on to this phone just in case. I'm, uh, I don't know what I'm ever going to use it for, but I might need it someday. But like, if I know that three months from now, I'm getting a home phone and I want to get this phone, if you're just watching or listening to the audio version, I'm, I'm holding up a phone here, an old home phone. Not that old. It's not like a rotary. <laughs> <laughs> so kids, phones used to actually have a string that went into the wall. <laughs> and, um, and, and so it could be just for when, like if I know I'm going to hold on to it for a particular thing. I mean, a lot of the things we buy just for when tend to be consumables. Like if you buy toilet paper. You're not just buying one square or one roll at a time. Usually you, you go buy a whole pack just for when you're going to need it. That's like something that's a decoration you put on your shelf there with the shelves that you don't put books in anymore. It's like, that's an old antique phone. He's talking about the phone, not the toilet paper. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know, man. That could be interesting on a shelf. 2020 decor. (laughs) Griffin's got a strange mantle uh, above his fireplace. It's just a bunch of toilet paper. But I do want to talk about music and musical instruments and equipment because it's really easy to fall into that trap that, oh, if I buy the right equipment, I will improve my music. Have you fallen into that trap ever? No. I'm probably the wrong person to ask about this question because I I suppose without even attempting to, I'm already very minimalist with with that stuff. Um, I, I used to only have three guitars. People gave me a couple guitars recently, so now I have five, I think. I have very little recording equipment. The stuff that I do have was given to me this year by a producer that I work with. And I just never, I thought, man, am I really going like, to try to build a studio and go down that road of getting all this gear? And even when I travel, I, I travel usually with one guitar. I have no effects pedals. I don't bring a mic. I don't bring a DI. I bring my guitar, a cord to plug in with, and my guitar tuner. And that's all I have. So the sound that's coming out of the board is like just me. It's just my voice, my voice, my guitar. The guy at the board might put a little reverb on there, but it's really hardly anything. And there's something freeing about rolling that way, I think, as opposed to having a studio full of stuff. Totally. I just feel like it weighs me down. I Sometimes I don't know if it's because like I'm a little bit too frugal or I just like the feeling of feeling like I don't have to worry about all these things. Well, and I think you, you said you might be the wrong person. To ask. It sounds to me like he's the perfect person Maybe to ask about this Maybe. because <laughs> what is it he's providing for us is the template right now. Like it is possible right. to record albums and hit albums that resonate with a large group of people without needing to be in, you know, a $7 million studio that used to exist. And there are still a few around in New York and L.A. and Nashville. But it is possible to do all of that with next to nothing. In fact, one might argue had you gone down the road of beginning to accumulate all of the right equipment, the best equipment, then it might have gotten in the way of the creative process at some point. Yeah. I think about even things with sound quality. Like I like hearing music out of like a little compressed, like old transistor radio where it kind of sounds small and maybe a little bit scratchy because there's something that feels a little nostalgic about it or maybe arty in a way. And that, that kind of feeling lends to the thinking of like, why are we spending so much time worrying about how this sounds exactly right and then spending all this time on mastering and running it through all this expensive gear when really, um, I think even that Oliver Anthony song was recorded on his phone, you know? Mm. So like they have these little built-in compressors and it's like, you don't need all this stuff. It's like, you just don't need it. It's more about, like we talked about before, it's not about the fidelity of the sound as much as it is about the the emotion that's being evoked by the piece of music yeah. and that's why you maybe don't need all that stuff yeah <laughs> that's yeah. A, i don't know mallory i know you have actually can you talk a bit about you've worked with music equipment a lot and and yeah. 
And uh, I'm sure you have similar experiences where people are buying things just for the sake of buying equipment. Oh, most definitely. Especially, I, I think guitar pedals can be the slippery slope with this. I used to work music retail before I came out here with the podcast. And I would see people come in and it was like they were collecting books all written by the same author. They would come in and go, oh, there's this new pedal by this brand. I got to have it. Don't even test drive it. They just, I got to have this because I could use this in gigs. And I know, especially with instruments, that can be tricky, right? Like the way I've used different instruments is the wand chooses the wizard. And when you have multiple guitars or multiple saxophones, like some of them just sing differently. They have a different resonance, a different tone. They have a different feel when you play them. And that matters when you're connecting with the emotion of the music you're playing. But I think some people get really excited about wanting to broaden their sound so much that they kind of lose themselves in the process of that. How do you handle that, Griffin, especially having suddenly five guitars where you didn't before, but you still have old faithful that you, you always come back to? I guess I'm glad that I've been able to be in the studio with a band for many years and make records like that where people are concerned about things that I'm not concerned about. I think mm. that's been helpful in the past, but now it's taken me over 20 years to realize that it'd probably be better for me to just make records by myself in a room with my guitar because that's how I play shows. And it, it, it going into a studio and recording with a band, even though it's really fun, like doesn't quite make sense for what I do because then I go out and I play my music acoustically. So, uh, but I've, I've been a little bit stuck in the old model of thinking of maybe we need a band here in case maybe the band will get it on the radio better. Or mm. I, I don't know, maybe we need to go work in the old traditional model. But I think moving forward, I'll probably, I feel a little encouraged or em empowered to just do things a little more minimal and a little more cre creatively by myself, which is how I kind of made my first album. So I, I made my first album on a digital um, 12 track and it was just me coming up with the overdubs and doing it by myself. And it feels like painting, you know, you're just kind of by yourself painting and um, that can be a really fun process as well. Yes. Mm. A little more lonely, but, but creative. Would you find it to be lonely if you were to try to go the route of having a home studio instead of going to a studio with a producer, with an audio engineer, people that can give you feedback in real time, how would you feel to have that creative power back on your side and it's just you and the music in your yeah, home space? I have fun doing that. I, I slip into a space where I'm not alone because I'm with the song. Yeah. So I ha the song's sort of my friend and we're working together on it to see what happens. But I do enjoy the feeling. This last EP that I made in Nashville was with a great group of guys and I was on a high like every day after the session ended because hearing those instruments come in and support these songs that you've written just on the guitar and hear it come to life with all this power and, and colors is is a really exciting process. And you you don't know how the songs are going to take shape until you hear all of those pieces fill in. And that can be a very exciting process. So um, I love doing that as well. Mm -hmm. But I, I think there is something to be said for being able to do stuff on your own. I think there's something about not yeah. needing mm -hmm. The band. Yeah. Because then that becomes a tether of sorts. Like, oh, I can't make music without it. I can't go play shows without it. When that's just a story that we tell ourselves. And what I hear from Griffin here is saying, yeah, I can totally do that. I can also do without that. Mm -hmm. Because I'm still me. My music is still my music, regardless of whether or not I have access to a full band or a full studio. I can get out there and play at Station One in Springfield, Ohio, <laughs> and create a memorable experience that people are talking about 15, 20 years later. And Griffin, I just want to acknowledge you because you've made some of the most amazing music of my life. And uh, I'm grateful to have you here and grateful to call you a friend. Oh, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Griffin House. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that highlight from the Minimalist Private Podcast. If you'd like another highlight, check out this video. If you'd like to watch the Minimal episode, check out this video. Or if you'd like to dive deep into full episodes of the Minimalist Private Podcast, head on over to Patreon. The link is in the description. Your support keeps our podcast and YouTube channel 100% advertisement free. 